Okay, so now let's start. Um, I think uh, we want to start with before the algebras. Um, spin groups. Dark object noise. And spin noise. So we have to cover these four topics uh, now. Uh, they all actually come from uh, the study of Clifford algebra. So this is the primary <coughs> object for us. So uh, let's define, let me define this Clifford algebra CLN. So this is, uh, so this is an algebra that's uh, generated by uh, symbols uh, E1, E2, say EN. Uh, that uh, satisfy this relation. Relations are exactly the relations that I derive. E i e j plus e j e i is equal to negative two delta i j. Of course, if you want, you can add one also. So you signal that uh, this is uh, the algebra. By algebra, of course, they mean associative algebra, and in this case, is even unitor algebra generated by these guys. Um, so uh, let's uh, just uh, get uh, so this is, you, you can imagine this is called Ent Clifford algebra. Uh, for certain type of metrics, uh, we'll soon see, but just let's look at it. So first of all, what is CL0? CL0, of course, is just R, right? There, there, there are no generators and it's just algebra. I mean, uh, I should say this is over R. So everything is real, right? For us right now. Okay, so CL0 is R. So what is CL1? Well, CL, CL1 is generated by one and E1. And there is one relation e one squared is equal to minus one. I mean, this is the defining relation for i. So, this um, is when when you say algebra, do you mean unitary and associative algebra, but not as you mean commutative? Yes, the unital associative algebra. Yes, exactly. And they the, the generated by these relations. Yes, exactly. Is that clear? Yeah. So so then, if if we assume it is unitary, I guess. You don't need the one as a generator. But. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's right. That's what I said, actually. I said you can put one, exactly. Or you can just say it's unital associative algebra. Yeah, it doesn't matter, I, I agree, right. Okay, so that's that one, that's uh, this one. So this is, so CL1 is actually complex numbers, right? That's, uh, um, so what is CL2? You have this. Uh, you have these generators. So maybe I just draw draw this one. Yeah. So then you have these generators e1 and e2. They satisfy this relation e1 squared equal to e2 squared is equal to minus one. But then there is another relation which is e1 e2 plus e2 e1 is equal to um, is I mean is equal to zero, right? Now, if you think about it a little bit, uh, you notice that perhaps you have seen this algebra before. This is uh, quaternions. So CL2 equal to H. This is quaternions. It was defined first by Hamilton around 1840s in Ireland, in Dublin, in fact, quaternions. Uh, so uh, typically you denote quaternions like this, right? So this you say, okay, so this H is, uh, you know, the set of all A plus BI plus CJ plus BK. And then you have relations I squared, J squared, K squared is equal to minus one and IJ equal to K and so on, right? 
you have these relations for 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 quaternions and the isomorphism cl2 if this uh, you have to write down an isomorphism of course so the isomorphism is like this so first of all what is a generic element of cl2 you can write it as a times one plus b e1 plus c e2 plus d e1 e2 okay but now you might complain that uh, how about e1 e2 E2, E1, so we can add uh, more terms to these uh, expressions because I just only said the algebra generated by this sort of thing. But the thing is, there are no other elements that you have to add because everything just simplifies. And you can write everything in uh, CL2 in terms of these uh, four elements one, E1, E2, and E1, E2. That's uh, easy to see, right? And now it's clear what the isomorphism should be. So you just send A1, sorry, sorry, A1 plus B1 plus C2 plus D1 to uh, A plus PI plus CJ plus B. So, um, yes, I mean, this is. Uh, very important uh, fact, CL2, we're going to use it again and again, is isomorphic to uh, quaternions of Hamilton. Now, uh, well, this is an interesting problem, it seems. So with this CL3, CL3 has generators again, E1, E2, E3, and uh, you have those relations. Um, I can tell you that dimension of this guy, I will uh, very soon uh, prove that dimension of this guy is, uh, is actually 2 to the 3, which is 8. So it's an 8 dimensional real associative algebra with unit. Now, but the question is, what kind of algebra is this? Uh, it turns out that this is actually isomorphic to H, TX sum H. It's a TX sum of two copies of quaternions. You can write down this isomorphism explicitly, but uh, I won't do it. Just you can do it as an exercise for understanding these things, but <coughs> I won't do it right now. So now, what we can say um, about, uh, I mean, okay, so if you go on, then finding out what CL4 is, it is even more difficult than CL5, and this sort of thing becomes more and more difficult, and uh, unless you see some pattern in their structures. So, uh, but what we can say in general about such things, so let me say some general facts that it's kind of easy to discover at first. So, uh, I mean, first of all, I mean, dimension of CLN over R is two to the N. So that's uh, significant because it means it's a finite dimensional algebra. It's not the infinite dimension. In fact, the linear basis you can construct for this space, linear basis, is uh, the following thing you have one e1 e2 en and then you've got e1 e2 and then e1 e3 and then you go on so you have two by two and you, you see e3 e1 you don't have to put it because it's negative e1 e3 so it's not just uh, and then en minus one en and then another kind of series starts with E1, E2, E3, and so on. And kind of last in the row is E1, E2, EN. The last generator. And you can quickly convince yourself that beyond these things, you don't need anything. Because if you multiply more than N elements from the basis, E1 into EN, uh, there's going to be two of them to be the same, 
And you can always uh, move around elements by using these sign rules, and then you, you reach EI squared or whatever is minus one. So always simplify to this. So that's a kind of hands-on low-key approach to understanding at this the basis uh, for this. So uh, you can then say that, okay, the basis elements are of the form EI1, EI2, EIK, where I1 less than I2, strictly less than I2, strictly less than I2. Okay, so what are all possibilities? Well, this is the set of all, uh, I mean, if you fix K, the set of all K element subsets of set of N elements. And if you change K from zero to N, you are looking at the set of all subsets of a set of N elements. Uh, so the number of such possibilities is going to be, uh, of course, you know, sums of all bin binomial uh, numbers and k's. I mean, k from zero up to n, this is equal to two to n. So, and that's the dimension. Okay, so that's that's the dimension. Now, uh, the second thing is that this algebra uh, is not graded, but it's uh, it's uh, Z two grade. We can write this as um, uh, CLN. We can write it as CLN zero direct sum CLN one. So what is the, so this is called even part and this is called odd part. So what is CLN zero? These are uh, this is the part of the Clifford algebra that has only even number of generators appear in the expressions. So generated by even number of generators, I mean multiples of these things, and this one by odd numbers. And they have this relation that CLNI, CLNJ is inside CLN I plus J. That's exactly the graded. The two graded algebra relations for i and j belonging to z over 2z. Hmm? So this addition is modulo 2, and this is this you can also you multiply even by even, you get even, even by odd, you get odd, odd by odd, you get even. So that's uh, this is a this is also a very important observation. And uh, another thing which is a bit more interesting is actually, I mean. Quite interesting is that CLN zero is actually isomorphic to CLN minus one. So this needs a proof. Uh, I will give a proof later on. You have to write an explicitly an isomorphism between these two algebras. So the even part of this Clifford algebra is isomorphic to the full Clifford algebra one one level lower. So I guess. Um, that's all I want to say. But if you if you, if you think about Clifford algebras like this, this is more or less like um, 19th century way of thinking of Clifford algebras. Um, so in 19th century, these things were called hyper complex numbers. Just uh, for historical uh, kind of hyper complex numbers. So as, as you know, I mean, after Hamilton discovered H, well, ha Hamilton was trying very, very hard at first to discover uh, so some generalization of complex numbers with uh, just, uh, uh, which would be like three-dimensional over R because complex numbers is two-dimensional over R and Hamilton tried to do something three-dimensional. And after a long time, he convinced himself that this is not, going to be possible, given what he had in mind. He had in mind something specific. But then he found an example in four dimensions. And then people started thinking about such objects, generalizing these things. And all these structures were eventually called uh, hypercomplex numbers. Uh, and then hypercomplex numbers in modern language, these are basically associative finite dimensional algebras. 
um, which sometimes they are semi-simple, sometimes they are not even, even semi-simple. They may satisfy some extra properties. But essentially, these are finite dimensional uh, real algebra or complex algebras. So, but the terminology of 19th century was not algebra, it was hacking Okay, in particular, Clifford was also interested in generalizing these Hamilton's constructions to higher dimensions. And apparently, he came up with this uh, sort of uh, things. Uh, Device. But uh, but again, we cannot just uh, work with those things, so we have to take a more abstract point of view, and that's what we are doing now. Next, are there any questions? So um, so now, so there's some sort of abstract theory. So now let's fix uh, B is a finite dimensional vector space over R and let G from B cross B to R be a uh, symmetric bilinear form. Then to this gadget of V and G, uh, we are going to define uh, a Clifford algebra of V and G, which is the following algebra. We are going to take um, uh, the tensor algebra of V and divide it by some ideal I. Uh, so what is tensor algebra? So tensor algebra of V is R direct sum V direct sum V tensor to direct sum V tensor three. I mean, uh, this is an infinite dimensional vector space, right? Uh, and then multiplication is just tensor, simple tensor multiplication. This multiplication here is universal, has nothing to do with this G. It's just multiplying. Con uh, by concatenation, basically, that's what, what, what the multiplication is. Okay. So it's called tensor algebra. Now, what is this I? I is a two sided ideal. Um, which is generated by, by the following element. Um, By such elements like x tensor x is equal to minus g of x and x times one. You see, this algebra has one in degree zero, right? And so you may uh, you may see the relation here as something like even x two plus uh, x two is equal to negative norm of x squared one because Sometimes we denote GXX by norm of X. Um, uh, alternatively, you can also write it as this X tensor Y. You can polarize this uh, relation X tensor Y plus Y tensor X equal to minus two G of uh, X and Y. You see, my, I'm claiming that this relation Postulating this relation is the same as this relation. So I'm saying for all x and y. If for all x and y you have this, then you have, of course, for x equal to y, you get this, and from this also you get uh, this relation. So this ideal, uh, no matter how we define it, this way or that way, is the same two sided ideal we can define, and that's the Clifford algebra. Okay, so now if you think about it, you, you notice that, of course, uh, the, um, 
the, 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 the um, decomposition in terms of degrees, I mean, in terms of parity, I mean, of course, CLVG is equal to CLVG uh, zero, Dirac sum CLVG one. Well, the even part, uh, you just add all the even tensors and you go to the quotient, you get this one. And for odd part, you take direct sums of all odd tensors and you go to quotient, you get this one. So that's, uh, it comes from this decomposition. And everything here is well defined because uh, these relations uh, respect even odd degree. Okay, what else uh, I wanted to say about it right now? Um, okay, maybe what is the, so, so why now, why we define it like this? So it's important to understand the universal property of this now. So first of all, let me give an example of this. Um, okay, I'm okay here. So here's an example. You can absolutely take uh, G equal to zero because I didn't say this to be non degenerate or positive definite or whatever. You can take G equal to zero, right? So if you take G equal to zero, okay, if you take G equal to zero, then uh, what do you get? Then uh, CL G zero is exactly, uh, I mean, same as exterior algebra of B. So this is the exterior algebra. Why? Because uh, we are in this case dividing by the relation uh, X tensor Y plus Y tensor X actually um, equal to zero for all X and Y. I mean, this is more or less the definition, the defining property of exterior algebra, right? So, I mean, exterior algebra is defined by taking tensor algebra, one definition is taking tensor algebra, dividing it by such relations. Okay, so this is, uh, this is equal to uh, R, here's some V, here is some V VHV. Now the notation is VEG, we use VEG instead of things, and then here is some higher VEG and so on. Of course, in this case, immediately you see that, I mean, dimension of this guy is equal to two to the N. I mean, dimension of uh, exterior algebra is famously two to the N, but in this case also dimension is two to the N. I mean, Dimension of this guy is two to the n. Uh, let me just show it, show it to you. So before doing that, so let's assume G is positive definite. So in that case, then we can take an orthonormal basis. This is uh, E1, E2, EN, EB. So we have these relations that G, EI, J is equal to 2 delta J. Of course, by basic results uh, about positive definite things, we know that such bases always exist. And there is not even one basis, there are zillions of different bases that you can construct, they satisfy this relation, right? And now, uh, in this case, CL, PG, is also holding to CLN, where N is, of course, the dimension of G. I mean, in this case, uh, because uh, you have uh, picked a basis for B, you can pick basis for, um, here, 
which is again similar to this construction products of such thing and isomorphism is just very simple right? um okay so that's one thing now um now of course uh, i mean if g is not positive definitely in general this is related to the question Jeremy asked. In general, you can, uh, you know, uh, you, 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 for, I mean, for any G, there exists a basis. I mean, this is basically a Sylvester's theorem. Um, yeah, it's Sylvester, yeah. It's, it's a 90th century result in linear algebra. It says that there is this basis E1 of this form, EP, EP plus one, EP plus Q, and then EP plus Q plus one up to E uh, N, such that these guys uh, are positive definite. On this part is negative definite, and on this part is totally zero. And then uh, they are all orthogonal to each other uh, for different values of indices. So in this case, you see that the, your CLM, uh, for example, it has the relations that EI EJ plus EJ EI equal to minus two G of EI EJ. And then you get positive, negative, or zero, right? So you get, you get all possibilities. But uh, we are not working with that right now. We are just working with positive definite. But they become important uh, for some considerations. I mean, uh, and uh, very soon we will see why uh, we want to focus on only positive definite ones. Are there any questions, by the way? OK, so now. Um, the universal property of this construction is important to know, which is the following. Uh, for any associative uh, unital uh, R algebra A for any linear map, uh, say uh, F from B to A such that F of um, B squared is equal to um, <coughs> sorry minus G of B B one. This this equation happens in in A now. For every B in in B, there exists a unique algebra map. Till now, um, um, uh, Clifford algebra of DG. Algebra map now. I mean, unital algebra map, right? From Clifford algebra of DG to, uh, to A, such that this diagram commutes. Remember, we have this map B inside, it's mapping into Clifford algebra of DG. And then we have got, so this is the canonical injection I, and we have this map going into A, that uh, this is F, and this uh, F tilde is the unique map. Such that this diagram commutes. So you can just uh, write uh, this map uh, here as the composition of this map. This is a way of uh, 
extending, in, in order to extend a map from B to California algebra of B and G, I mean, uh, I mean, in order to extend a map from Clifford algebra to A, it's enough to have a map from B to A that satisfies this relation and vice versa. This is the universal property in, in categorical sense, right? So that's, uh, I mean, this is obvious from the definition, right? So if, um, our definition. Right, so that's uh, there is nothing to prove here. Uh, if you go through the definition, all right. So, what else you want to do with this uh, at this general level? Um, now, um, As I said, um, the dimension of uh, this guy, CLDG over R, is always two to the n. I mean, this is for any G, right? That's interesting for any G. So the dimension of this, as a linear space, basically, uh, this is independent of choice of. Uh, the bilinear form, a symmetric form G. It's the algebra structure that drastically depends on, on, on choice of uh, on choice of G. That's one thing to notice. Now another thing I want to mention is that this uh, what this universal property implies. You see. Um, there is a, there is a, this group, uh, I mean, this thing, space, right, that O, B, G. This is the orthogonal group of this vector space, right? So this is the set of all linear maps F from B to B uh, that respect this G, such that uh, F of, um, I mean, G of X, Y, if you want is equal to g of f of x f of y, right? So uh, this is called the orthogonal group of, uh, I mean here. So it's called the orthogonal group of dg. Right? This is the orthogonal group. Now, um, well, I mean, um, Using this universal property, you immediately notice that actually the orthogonal group itself acts on Clifford algebra, right? O of VG. Uh, there is a, you get a map from here into automorphism groups of Clifford algebra of PG. Um, well, I mean, this is a group map, okay, group homomorphism. This is an associative algebra. You look at it's all automorphism, one to one, onto maps that preserve this algebra structure. And this maps uh, into automorphisms of this. I mean, uh, wh why, why, why is that uh, the case? I mean, well, take this F from B to B, and then you just go into CLBG in this case, and you notice that this relation exactly means that the, uh, the defining relation for Clifford algebra is satisfied. So you get a map, F tilde, from CLBG to CLBG. By using universal property. And this, this is a group homomorphism that's easy. And uh, you just take this. Right? So now um, let's apply this result in a special case. 
Here's a map which I believe uh, you can call it alpha. So alpha of uh, a, alpha of b, for example, is equal to minus b. Right? I mean, this map satisfies a uh, universal property. So basically, I mean, just compo compose it. It's still I mean, so I, even, I, I don't have to repeat my argument. I just say that, well, this is, this map belongs, so alpha belongs to, um, belongs to um, OOBG. Because if you multiply by minus b, the metric relations are satisfied. G of minus b minus w is equal to g of b and w. Okay, so then you get you immediately get a map alpha tilde uh, belonging to uh, automorphisms of triple algebra. But this map, we know exactly what it is. I mean, on, on basis elements, it's alpha tilde of E1, E2, Ek. If you write some basis elements, this is going to be equal to minus 1 to the k, E1, E2, Ek. So this, uh, but this is an automorphism, an alpha tilde restricted to Cl0 is identity, and alpha tilde restricted to Cl1. Is equal to minus element. And of course, alpha tilde squared is equal to one. So it's exactly the kind of uh, automorphism that defines the parity, even an odd part in this algebra. So that's the one thing. We can also define um, a um, reversion map. An anti automorphism, which is called reversion. So, if you want uh, the reversion of uh, some uh, basis elements, E1. Uh, EI1, I mean, okay, so let me write it like this E1, E2, EK is basically EK, EK minus 1, E1. It takes the same element in, the, in some basis and then you reverse the orders. And now you, you notice that this is an um, anti automorphism. Anti automorphism. And finally, we can use these two things to define a norm map, which is a generalization of norm of, uh, uh, I mean, um, I mean, norm really is, just goes to, um, Clifford algebras itself, CL to CL, sorry. This, um, at first, the way it is defined uh, is this. So, um, um, sends X to norm of X, which is equal to X times X star. Where x star is now equal to um, alpha of x, and then uh, reverse it. Uh, did I put reverse here? Yeah, reverse. So there's, you apply reversion, then you apply alpha, you get that, which is the same as you apply alpha into reversion x. They, they are the same thing. Now, if you, um, so this is the norm map, and this is the, um, say, you can call it conjugation. You can actually check these things uh, in, in uh, simple examples. You see that these are well known objects. 
mean well-known constructions. So let me give one example. Remember we had CL1 equal to C. Our first um, uh, X uh, star is the conjugation of X. Is that what you mean? X star? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah X star is going to, uh, yeah, this is conjugation, yeah. X star is conjugation of it, exactly, yeah. Okay. So now in this case, of course, X star, I mean for a complex number, this is Z bar. And N of Z is Z times Z bar. And for CL2, which was H, this is also well known. In this case, um, if you have a quaternion, which is A plus IB plus JC plus PK, I mean Q star is A minus IB minus JC minus PK, you can check. And uh, Q, Q star, N of Q, this is A squared. B squared plus C squared plus B squared. And so on. Okay. So right now we have enough uh, knowledge of Clifford algebras. Of course, we will do more uh, next lecture. But right now we have enough knowledge uh, of Clifford algebras to discuss uh, spin groups. Uh, Because that's also, as I said, you need spin group and spinners. Are there any questions so far? Yeah, okay. So now uh, let's look at the spin groups. So, I mean, so what is a spin group? I mean, you can understand actually spin groups to some extent without appealing to Clifford algebras. So the kind of reason for existence of spin groups is the following. I mean, the reason is that this group SON, which is the special orthogonal group, Now, this group um, is not uh, simply connected. Not simply connected. For um, actually any end. So let, let me tell you actually what the pi one of this group is. I mean, I'm sure you have done in, in algebraic uh, topology somewhere that pi one of SON is actually equal to Z mod to Z, right? For M bigger than or equal to three. So it means that there is a loop based at identity element of uh, SO3, for example, that cannot be shrunk to the identity element. I will tell you actually what that loop is. Uh, and then for um, n equal to two, well, this is SO2 is just a Z, right? And um, SO1, well, it's trivial, right? For n equal to one, you don't care. Okay, so it, it, this is the, the range that we are interested in. And we get n equal to three. So for example, SO3 Okay, so then uh, what I'm saying is that then by general uh, facts about uh, covering spaces, you, you know that uh, there exists a universal covering for these things. So the spin and group, this is the universal 
Programming group. Of uh, SOM. So let's uh, be in dimension and begin in to three. So in other words, we have this group of spin n that enters into a uh, exact sequence of groups and topological spaces like this. So what is that two? Z2 is a group with two elements plus minus one. <clears throat> so it's the multiplicative group of uh, with two elements. Okay, so this group is spin by some abstract uh, kind of arguments, which is uh, difficult in anyhow. And you know that this exists, and there is this exact sequence, so you can untangle, unravel uh, that uh, non contractible loop. If you go upstairs, upstairs there is no nothing. So let me give some example of this. I mean, let's take n equal to three. For example, here we have SO3. And here, um, there is uh, this group SU2. And here is there's a two, and there is one. Now, what is SU2? SU2 is S3. Uh, you may want to, to brush up a little bit of group theory to convince yourself or look up this fact. There's a nice isomorphism between SU2 and S3. And what is SO3? SO3 um, is actually a real projective three space. I mean, um, it's a group, but in this case, it turns out to be a real projective space also. So here is a very concrete realization of a spin group for, this is a spin three then. Okay, so, but, but okay, so you can, you can do this sort of constructions uh, in, in this uh, low dimensional cases, but to get a kind of hands-on uh, understanding of a spin group, you have to go inside Clifford algebra and construct the spin group as uh, inside the group of invertible elements of the Clifford algebra. So that's what we're going to do. And by doing that, we, we are going to get a much deeper knowledge of a spin group rather than this very abstract construction, which is um, doesn't give us much to work with eventually. I mean, conceptually it's very good, but calculationally this is not good, but we'll go into Clifford algebras to construct this spin. And amazingly, this is the second application of Clifford algebras for us. Um, um, defining those gamma matrices was the first one, now this is the second application. And there will be maybe another one also so I'm going to stop the video now. Uh, are there any questions, by the way, right now? Uh, before, maybe I should have stopped the video and then you ask your questions.